Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and a very, very warm welcome to the channel. I had promised to get on with some interesting games when it comes to the chess.com Isle of Man tournament and I remember saying I was not going to do this until the FIDE World Cup finals were over. I really had a change of mind on this because yesterday during round three, which in fact coincides with round three of the FIDE finals, we had seen a librarian, James Tarjan, a player of an ELO of only 24-12, beat Kramnik, who is a super grandmaster. How did this happen? Well, it may just be easier to watch this clip to get an idea. In today's game between Ding Liren and Levon Aronian, I'm not sure what to expect. I just don't hope to see disappointment on the board. But if the result leads to no winner, prepare to see these two fight it out during the Rapids. We just have to wait and see. Given the fact that Ding Liren has never been beaten by Aronian, do expect the game to be of a high quality. Aronian is a very tricky player. But whatever he tried on Ding Liren just didn't work so far. Aroni is going to start up with the white pieces. Oops, allow me to take that back. Aroni is expected to start up with the black pieces. But you know, it doesn't really matter. Long past other times when white was considered far stronger. And this just might explain Vashila Graf going for the black pieces during the Armageddon game against Levon. The fourth final game is about to get cracking in just a few minutes so expect me to pause from time to time. Not huge pauses but pauses nevertheless. Given Liren loves to go for a d4 opening he also went for a knight 3 opening in Sharjah earlier this year against Levon but there is no need to speculate because Liren just made his first move. The very expected d4 and now with knight f6, c4, e6 and knight f3 we have a very familiar setting. Through d5, knight c3 and bishop b4 it seems we have quite a decent game today. The Move of the bishop to b4 brings into play the Ragazin variation of the queen's gambit declined. Normally white can go for bishop g5 and yes, this is what Liren went for. We quickly saw c takes, taking the game into the Vienna variation of the queen's gambit declined. And now with e4, this is the game we want to see. h6 led to the exchange of the bishop for the knight. And now with the recapture of the C pawn, Levon brings on the board the very solid C5. The game is moving very fast indeed. With castles and castles, Liren went right for the queen, pushing it back to base. And this is in fact the best square to go for. I expect the pawn on C5 to go, but no, Ding went for knight E4. And this is going to drop the pawn on d4. And yes, it does happen. Liren does not recapture here and goes for queen e2. And I think here, though knight c6 can cover the d4 pawn, Levon bypasses the normal approach to hold on to this d4 pawn and got the bishop out to d7. Liren is taking his time, probably trying to work out if rook d1 works and preferably which of the two rooks to move. He did go for this move using his kingside rook. After knight c6, we do have a very nice and interesting position and there are plenty of options for both players. Getting this e4 knight back to g3 was very unexpected, but I'm dying to find out why Liren pulled him out of the action. With the bishop coming back to c5, to probably defend as much as he can this d4 pawn, I think there is going to be a huge struggle to see if this pawn on d4 can survive. And if so, how? You know, it was for this reason why the bishop got in on c5, 
just because Lira allowed it when he moved his knights out to g3. And the only reason why the knight jumped on g3 is to just allow the queen to get onto this e4 square, I'm sure. And indeed, we do see Liren go for this move, trying to add the pressure on the king side. Whatever Liren does, he needs to be very quickly, because after the knight moves back to e7, it will be the bishop's turn to find c6, and that queen would need to make her way out of e4. After knight e7, for example, the b-pawn is also open for the taking, but don't you dare go for him because once the bishop gets in on c6, the queen needs to return to b3 to cover the f3 knight. And certainly this is not the position white wants to be in. Apologies if I'm losing my voice again, but I'm trying to, I will try and muddle through. Apologies again if I'm going to come back a few moves because I was with the impression a queen to e4 move was committed. But in fact, it wasn't. After bishop c5, Liren went for a3 with ideas of chasing after this bishop on c5. Since the bishop can retreat to b6, this is not an urgent move to commit to right now. Once the knight got back to e7, Aronian carried out a simple plan irrespective of whether the queen was on e4. Surprise, surprise, Liren loses a tempo by returning the knight to e4, probably going after the bishop now, but since b6 was available, Aronian got the bishop to station there. And here was the perfect opportunity to grab this d4 pawn. So who stands better here with this position? Aronian for sure has the edge, and certainly white has created weaknesses in his play. There is a lot of weight and attention to this e5 pawn and whether Liren likes it or not, the pressure will mount. After knight g6, a move Aronian went for, the knight can cover through f3, but once the queen shows her presence on c7, it is game on for sure. Rather than knight f3, rather than knight f3, Liren got his queen involved and now with Aronian bringing his own lady into the game, once the queen's retired, we saw a4, and I guess with ideas to get that bishop out of the way. Though a6 is possible, Aronian returned the knight to g6, and only when Liren went for a5, it was very obvious how he was going to play this one out. Aronian grabbed the knight on d4, and once the rook recaptured, forget knight takes because it doesn't work. Or does it? Bishop e2 will get the bishop in on c6, and this works fine actually. Rather than going for this e5 pawn, Levon got his bishop in on c6 first, and after b4, once the knight took the pawn, Liren went for the bishop, a move that led to two minor pieces coming off, and though another two pieces could have come off with this simple move, which I really expected, Aronian chose to preserve his knight by repositioning him to d7. Rook d4 got the knight moving again, and by getting his rooks together, Levon went for this rook c8 move. We then saw h4, king f8, and once we see the kings moving, we can already smell the end game. h5 got the king to e7, and here with rook g4, Liren was looking to grab this g pawn. Aronian covered the pawn, and though the rook on g8 is not ideal, this is a sacrifice you have to go for to keep your extra pawn on the board. Once the bishop got his place on e2, this was going to be another tough game irrespective of who wins if we do have a winner. Though Levon is better, given he still needs to find, or better, earn his first victory against Liren, he still has a long way to go. b6 invited the bishop on f3, and now getting the rook behind the knight, once these b-pawns came off, I am sure this f3 bishop was looking to be placed on c6. No, Liren instead went for rook a1, 
And now with the rook needed to come in on c7 to stop any unlikely checks, this bishop move to c6 was eventually committed to. It was not a question of if, but when. f5 going for the rook got the rook back to g3, and now with the king coming back to f7, just to free up the g8 rook, rook d1 led to rook a7, and Aronian probably is no longer better off here. Rook g6 was an excellent choice of move because it denies black the chance to open up the g-file. So after Aronian began to mess up with his a-rook, Dean came up with g4, and now once the g-pawns disappeared, Levon was going for a win, but Liren was going for yet another draw. Aronian came up with rook to h3, and though it check on f4 was expected, Liren wanted that knight out of c5 and offers an exchange by placing his own bishop on e4. The exchange led to yet another pawn dropping, but I see why Liren went for this move. Do I have any takers in 2, 1 and pause? The move you're looking for and therefore the move Liren is going to go for is rook d7 check giving this a 99.9 .9 probability. And indeed, this was the move in the game. King f6 was going to lead to this rook d6 move, and we're now going to be looking at a series of checks. I expect Levon to go for this pawn on b5, because after a check on e6, king f5 will... Re king f5 will recoup the pawn on b6, and with this exchange, the very best white can go for is a draw, but he needs to put up a damn good fight. But after the rook to d6 move, I think Levon blunders because he stuck his rook on e5, and once the rooks came off, Liren was free to take this so important pawn on b6. Rushing his pawn to g5 led to rook b7, h5. And now with a pawn creeping up the board, this was probably going to be another thrilling endgame. h4 pushed the rook in on f7, and now with rook d8, any advantage Levon had blew it, just like he did in his previous game. Is there a curse on him? He's always so good in his endgame play, but we're not seeing Levon playing lately. He reaches a dream position, and out of nowhere, he just loses his advantage. After b7, this is going to be another draw whether you like it or not. A check on d1 got the king marching up the board, but this rook's move is very restricted. For now, Levon only has b1, and after f3, this was it, with the two players agreeing to yet another draw. What now? Well, we have to wait until Wednesday when the two meet again. With a day's rest for the players to recharge the batteries, be ready, or better, let them be ready. Until then, many thanks for taking part, and many, many thanks for watching. This was your Chess Puzzler.